So I've been doing uppercase for a lot longer than I ever thought I would. Um, I started it in 2008 and the first issue came out in 2009. Um, and you can see, you know, some of it behind me. This is the issue 54 that just is coming out right now. Um, so yeah, the, the story of uppercase is really, you know, very personal to me. It's my story because throughout most of the history of uppercase magazine, it's just been me um, with lots of contributors and, and inspiration around me. But the day-to-day the -day has been um, me for quite a bit of it. <laughs> My apologies for whatever happens outside. I'm on a busy street in, in downtown Calgary. Um, so I'll go back um, to the very beginning and I'll, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Okay, everyone can see that? We can see that, yes. Okay, great. All right, so to, to, I, I'm calling it a case study because that's what the, the theme of, of this, these sessions are, but Truth be told, I never create reports or case studies or do any of those things or report out to other people because I don't have to. As a one person show, I save a lot of time by not having to like uh, do those sorts of things. Of course, I have lots of great data that I have access to on a daily basis and I'm very much a numbers person, but um, my case study is gonna be pretty much a, a creative slideshow. So um, going back in time, I do have a background in publishing because when I was a kid, <laughs> my very favorite thing to do was to create little books and magazines and um, really just force my family to sign them out of my little traveling library. So here's a few of them. This is 1982 when I was um, just about 10. Um, this is my very first magazine from July 6, 1982, Janine's Magazine for Kids. Um, and as you can see, I did not have a copy editor because I didn't know how to say the, or spell the word features and the content was <laughs> a little strange. Um, and I also just made these on the back of papers that my parents would bring home from their offices. So my dad was a um, structural uh, drafts person. So he had lots of blueprints that he would bring home. And my mom was an executive secretary. So she had a lot of typing. So all my early publications um, were one-sided and then the other side has some weird stuff from my parents' um, businesses. So here's one of my first books. It's Janine's storybook. And there's two little stories in there. And then I got into doing uh, magazines in cereal. So this is an orange book, which I branded um, Things to Make by Janine V. And this is a little book about making little books. So <laughs> very meta. Um, and it just uh, kind of a little insight into my brain that I, I just love books and I always have. Um, this is a little bit later, it's a bit older, I had better handwriting. And this is a, a dandy mini book by me and I call it Crafts. And then I had the nerve to trademark the word crafts. <laughs> um, and it was in a little um, envelope repurposed from uh, like a little library envelopes. And then I had three different issues and I'd carry them around in this little envelope. So that was my background as an early publisher. And it's not a surprise that I really love graphic design. And that's where I ended up studying um, at art college so that I can combine my love of images and text and bring those together. So I graduated from the Alberta College of Art and Design in 1995 and started doing freelance work um, pretty soon right after. And I did that for about a dozen years doing uh, arts and culture clients, nonprofits. Um, so I would design arts festival um, logos and event materials and Calgary Opera, Theatre Calgary, various publications and even um, uh, a few nonprofit magazines. So that's where I kind of um, wet my feet in the world of, of actual design in a practical sense. And then in 2005, the opportunity arose to rent a space in downtown Calgary in a building that was called Art Central. And the um, concept of the building was, was three levels with artist galleries and shops. Um, and if you wanted to be a tenant there, you had to have some sort of public facing aspect. So I decided to move my design business, which had been in my home for a dozen years, um, into a public space 
And my design office um, was in the back and the um, forward facing part was called uppercase gallery books and paper goods. And here is just like a little, the very first sketch I did of the logo that would become um, the uppercase logo. Um, so here's a little look in through the window. Um, so basically the design business was what was paying the rent and how I was earning my keep. Um, and then the front part, the uppercase part became kind of a, a laboratory or a place for me to um, figure out what I like to um, do and create in a public sphere. So it made sense that I would sell greeting cards. So these are ones I designed and eventually I wholesaled them. Um, I had a fabulous collection of curated publications from other publishers about design and craft and visual culture. Um, I hosted workshops, mostly about design and typography, bookmaking. Um, I spent a whole year thinking about William Shatner. We did a um, event slash exhibition called The Shatner Show. And this was in 2007, back when William Shatner was turning 76 years old. Um, so we had 76 pieces of art inspired by William Shatner. And he endorsed our use of his face and gave us some nice quotes and um, I produced this hardcover book, which was the first um, book that I produced as uppercase. Um, so it was a really strange year to think about him because I'm not like a super Star Trek fan or anything, but just the concept of this show about William Shatner was really what intrigued me. And um, it was great. Uh, I learned so much about um, managing a project and getting 76 different artists involved and curating the show, putting up the exhibition, doing all of the um, the press for it. Um, so yeah, it was a good learning experience. If kind of we're weirdly outside of everything else I've ever done, but a foundation is an example of a gallery exhibition that I designed for inside my studio space. Um, I made handmade notebooks using um, reclaimed papers and off cuts from uppercase projects. So those are all the foundations of things that I was actually doing in the early days of uppercase. A lot of it was like hands-on tactile stuff. It was bringing people into the space. It was curating ex exhibitions. Um, and it was all done just out of the spirit of experimentation. Um, eventually, um, a few years in, uppercase started to be able to you know, pay its rent and that sort of thing. But through all of this, it's the graphic design business that was supporting these um, experiments. Um, I started to publish more books. This is before I even started the magazine. Um, so Old School was an exhibition I had in my space about um, being inspired by the aesthetics of education. Work Life was a directory, of, in this case, of Canadian illustration and photography. And it was a interesting model for funding in that the participants in that book paid me and I produced the book and then I promoted everyone um, to art directors across Canada to all their dream clients with the effort to um, promote everybody. And then these other two books, one was an exhibition and then Camilla Engman is a Swedish artist and we did a monograph all about her work. So I just really love publishing and decided like that's where my heart was at. So um, years into doing both uppercase and client work, I was ready to just Kind of let the client work go in order to really pursue my own entrepreneur um, ideas. So the idea of having something that was predictable and ongoing was where the magazine idea came <laughs> into a play. Of course, I had no idea, um, you know, how difficult it is to make a magazine, run a magazine, the logistics of all of it. But as a graphic designer, um, as it really appealed to me that having um, a, a magazine would be great for me to express my creativity as a designer and as a, as a curator. So I just forged ahead and this was 2008 when I decided to do it. And um, around 2008, 2009 when, was when a lot of magazines that I really enjoyed reading were biting the dust. So there was Martha Stewart's Blueprint magazine and the first iteration of Domino magazine out of the States. So those ones just went kaput. Um, and so what I realized was that I needed to make sure that uppercase wasn't relying at all 
on any sort of advertising revenue, that it would always be supported by readers. Like that is, was going to be the, the primary way that uppercase would be supported. Oops. Um, so I would create the concept was that, um, you know, with these magazines that I love that were disappearing, I wanted a publication that could inspire me and inform me as a graphic designer who was interested in lots of different things. So I, I love typography, illustration, craft, art, um, vintage things. So I wanted to have all of these inspirations that are kind of outside of my main focus area being designed to come in and inform me as a graphic designer. So that's where the concept started from. It's evolved quite a bit since then, but the idea, the basic um, heart of it is it's a magazine for the creative and curious. And with a broad um, slogan like that, creativity and curiosity, it has allowed me to explore so many different topics over the years. So in the early days when the magazines first came out is also like, you know, 20, 2009, 2010, and the iPad was really um, kind of a new shiny toy. And Martha Stewart Living, for example, and Wired magazines had all these amazing interactive uh, iPad versions with video and animations and all sorts of things. Um, I knew that was way beyond anything that I could ever do. So I vowed that uppercase would always be print only. So this is a little shot of the first issue, number one from 2009. Um, and the magazine was funded uh, through pre-orders. So at the time I still had my gallery and I had um, a newsletter list that I started just for like the, you know, the gallery promotions in person sort of thing. Um, if you think back to 2009, the social media was really flicker and our blogs, those were the primary ways that we were connecting online. Um, so I had a, a decent blog following at the time and um, that's how I started promoting the concept of the magazine. And gratefully I had 400 people who subscribed um, in time for that first issue to come out and that basically you know, paid for the print run and postage. And then after that first issue came out, then people saw that I meant what I was saying, that I could deliver a magazine and then more subscribers came on, which would help fund the next issue and then so on. And I had a line of credit of $50,000 that the bank had bestowed upon me when I started Uppercase Publishing. Um, and so the, the subscriptions and the line of credit is how I was able to just keep going um, and enter year two of the magazine. Um, so those first years, the goal was always to be supported by my readership. I had some advertising just out of the gate. I thought, well, magazines usually have ads. I should have ads. So the ads I had were like from my art college. They had a full page. Um, and some of the people inside the magazine, I would just give them um, free ad space for having contributed. Um, there were uh, some... Etsy shops and independent artists who um, would buy little ad spaces. And I had um, kind of like a roundup of um, one page where there were tiny little ads for everyone and I would design the ads for people. Um, so I, I did try ads for a while, but it was a lot of work for me trying to get them. And then, um, I don't know, it just never seemed like it was gonna be um, a big, part of the magazine and maybe I just didn't put a lot of effort into becoming a salesperson for ads. Um, so fairly soon after starting the magazine, I just kind of put ads to the side as something I didn't need to do and then I'd have more room for content anyway. Um, we received one grant from Canada Council back in the very, very early days and it was $19,000 um, and it was very specifically for developing our audience um, outside of Canada. Um, and so we were able to use that money to go to some craft fairs called Renegade Craft Fairs. And we went to um, Brooklyn, New York, and to San Francisco and to Los Angeles and participate in craft fairs and, and sold our magazines and stuff. And um, it was nice to have the grant money, but it did not result in anything. <laughs> 
<laughs> as far as subscribers really. Um, so never really invested into doing more grants. Um, and we were also advised that um, uppercase is too specifically me, that they, if I wanted to have more grants, I would have to um, change the content, um, be careful of the percentage of Canadian content and um, be more than just uh, my personal vision. So I stayed afloat with the line of credit and more subscribers. So this is um, the covers from the first few years. And this is still back in the days when I had my gallery in Art Central and it, um, I had a gallery attendant who, who would you know take care of um, sales in the shop and stuff. And I was still doing a bit of design for clients but mostly uppercase magazine was, was the revenue stream at this point. So just an illustration of how I felt like I was doing everything, keeping it all afloat. So I became a mom in 2010. And so that put a lot of focus on my time. And I'm very grateful that I became a mother just a few issues after I founded the magazine, because if I had become a mother and then tried to launch a magazine, that would have been near impossible. But having started the magazine and I, I was like at issue six when I had Finley. And I remember I had proofread the printer proofs, signed off on it, called FedEx, put it in the mailbox. It was a Friday. <laughs> went into labor sometime on the weekend and then I was at the hospital but I knew that FedEx was going to be picking up my proofs and it was taken care of for a while and that's just ever since like from day one I've managed motherhood and magazine parenthood if you will um, so the best thing about it was that when I did work on the magazine I was super focused I didn't want to waste time away from my child. I just wanted to make sure that when I did uppercase, I put my very fullest effort in it. And that has been the uh, secret for my success really is that ability to um, really focus in on when I need to get work done. So for a while, I still had the public space um, in, the, in the gallery while I, I stayed home um, kind of for a maternity to leave. Um, and all of that was just sort of breaking even. Um, thankfully, I had that line of credit that I would dip into. And then, you know, people would pay for the subscriptions and I would get back to zero and then I'd have another print bill and then use the line of credit, work my way back up. Um, you know, and I was still, uh, I had a salary that I was pulling from that. So it was working, but it wasn't really a business that had um, any potential at that time. Um, it was around this time that a lot of magazines were launching indie magazines. So um, there was some good, healthy competition, um, but I've never really felt like other magazines were necessarily my competition. I think if people love magazines, they're gonna love various magazines. Um, so I just you know keep my head down and focus on what I'm best at. And for me, I knew that maintaining a consistent publishing schedule was going to be really important for me. Like that's the basic thing of a magazine is that you can predict when it's going to come out, that it's, um, it's quarterly schedule for me. And, and so no matter what, I was going to um, meet all of those deadlines and never have a late issue or anything. So I think that set uppercase apart that people trusted me when they were going to give their, $80 or $120 for a subscription that they knew that I was going to deliver on it. Um, in the first few years, um, there were a few retail indie boutiques that would stock uppercase, but I didn't have a distributor because I couldn't afford the whole amount that would go to the distributor and the shipping. And then I didn't want to have any wastage. I didn't want the magazines to be pulped if they didn't get sold. So um, it was a number of years before I found some relationships that would work um, for me. Um, and so continuing the idea that readers are going to support the magazine, that's always been my focus. So I officially gave up on even thinking about advertising and that was an excellent decision for me. 
and um, also gave up on applying for grants because the comments that I would get back is that it's just too, it's too much about my own personal whims at that point and they, the government wasn't interested in um, funding those sorts of projects. So here's the numbers from 2009 to 2014 just showing the growth of the paid subscribers that Uppercase had in those early times. Um, so 2013, I'm calling this the low point <laughs> because I, I, it was getting exhausting um, to have this magazine that people loved and I had a decent number of subscribers, but I couldn't get it out of the financial hole. And I tried to bring on, I had employees, I had a, a, a subscription manager person and I had a um, marketing director and I tried a few interns, editorial interns once in a while um, and try as we might, we couldn't get past a certain like plateau of sales and the cost of having um, all these the salaries and including my own and then the print bills was becoming uh, impossible. So it was, I was really hoping that having say an employee who was in charge of marketing, for example, that they would know what they were doing and that they could grow subscribers. And meanwhile, I could be focusing on editorial, but basically I was spending my time managing employees and it was really just draining all the joy that I had had um, for uppercase in the beginning. Uh, so for me, employees are just incredible stress. Like the worst stress I've ever had was when I was trying to manage the, the employees and the, the finances and trying to make it all work. Um, we couldn't grow fast enough. Um, it was costing me money. It was costing me subscribers. It just wasn't working. Um, and the ideas of what a traditional magazine were what a magazine office should be all those things at this time i just kind of let them be put them aside like it wasn't going to be applicable for for me so i did a big reboot i unplugged the whole thing in 2014 and the um the reason was i was in a dire situation financially um, i didn't have enough to um, that line of credit was, you know, at its pit and I didn't have enough to pay me and the salaries and the print bills. So something had to give. So for a while, I didn't pay myself. Um, but being the only bread earner, breadwinner in the family, that's not going to last very long. So in March of 2014, I took um, Marie Forleo's B-School, um, which is a online business marketing course. Um, and that was life changing for me because as a graphic designer, I had zero training in marketing or business communications or any of those like the basic things. Um, so it was illuminating and I really um, understood what I should be doing and that the, the gut feeling I had that I need to take things back to um, like reboot this whole thing and, and get back to my roots. Um, that's what I decided to do. So. I had to let everybody go, which was just simply awful. Um, but out of all of that, um, obviously without having two and a half other salaries, um, I got out of the financial hole really quickly. Um, and I employed all the techniques that I had been le learning in B-School. And within just a few months, I was out of debt and I was on the other side of zero. And I've never had to go down into the pit since then. So it was really... Um, a miraculous recovery. Um, and for me, I was also able to do the projects that I wanted to do that I hadn't been able to because I was managing employees. So I released a big fat hardcover book all about the typewriter, which was a dream project of mine. And then um, a few years later, 2016, I started, um, it's called the Uppercase Encyclopedia of Inspiration, which um, you can sort of see them back there, They're like really big three, four, 500 page books about creative topics. Um, so here's the numbers in this time period. After the reboot, um, I was able to just kind of take back the reins of communications and talk to readers, you know, from me to them. And that was really good for, for growing the subscriptions um, up. 
So these, I call them the growing years after the low point was growth. Um, and when I let people go in 2014, I started my weekly newsletter every Tuesday. I send out a message to my readers and I just started at the very beginning explaining, you know, how rough it had been and why I was doing these changes and what I hope to do with uppercase. Um, and it's pretty like raw and emotional for me to share those things with the readers who at that point didn't really know much about me. Um, but it was the best thing I could possibly could have done. And since then, my focus on for uppercase has always been about publishing the best possible quality thing that I can do. Um, and it celebrates print with no, like it's, there's no, no reason to think that any of this is going to become digital and print. Like my, my focus at this time was completely all in on print. <laughs> um, so top quality as best as I could do. Um, I've never thought of uppercase as like a lifestyle or a brand or anything, but certainly it's become a brand um, just by way of having decade or so of time spent with uppercase. Um, I have done some collaborations with other companies like um, Wyndham Fabrics to create um, quilt weight fabric with um, the patterns that I've developed um, for the magazine. Um, but those are side projects. Always the focus is on creating content. Um, and one of the secrets of success there has been to involve my readership as much as possible in the content of the magazine. Um, so there's always open calls um, for contributions where people can participate and share their work. So um, it's usually, you know, a good 30 pages or so of the magazine is reader submissions. Um, and these peop people submit and I um, curate the best ones. And then I got to know a lot of the readers and have commissioned illustration and um, a lot of them have contributed articles. Um, so everyone who contributes now was a subscriber first and then we developed a relationship and they became paid contributors. And like I said, the, um, the tactile beauty of print is always celebrated in all my publications. So um, I do extra things like when I had a smaller print run, I could do like hand um, apply little bits of vintage fabric on one cover. I've had little pieces of paper inserted inside. I've had different um, paper stocks. And then the books that I do are always um, got special touches like, you know, dust jackets and belly bands. So that tactile thing is just really important um, for uppercase and for my readers. Um, also important to me personally is to be sustainable. So um, a few years ago, 2018, I believe it was, I started planting a tree for every subscription or renewal. And then a few years ago, now I've been doing that for every um, online order, a uh, tree is planted. Sorry for my typo. <laughs> um, and then um, I also send out all of the um, magazines now in craft mailers instead of poly bags and the um, entire um, sequence for uppercase is plastics free so even at my printer now they, they don't use plastic tape they use paper tape and at the warehouse we use um, environmentally responsible packaging so that's been important um, for uppercase and I think my readers have appreciated it um, with the craft envelopes, a lot of them, um, I encourage them to create artwork or reuse the craft envelope. And so people draw and paint on them or turn them into little books and then share them on Instagram or with me to show me what they've made. So um, I really love that relationship there. And so now here we're into the pandemic years. This was the issue that um, had just been on press when... I don't know why it won't let me advance there. Okay. Um, so I, I did, I am at my office right now, but during early pandemic years, I worked from home. Um, my husband had been doing customer service for uppercase for a while, but I basically let him go so that he could do things that he was more suited for. He has his own company now doing a board game production design. Um, so I've been doing everything uppercase since 2019. So moving to home hasn't been a real 
big upheaval, um, just uh, managing my time and homeschooling my son. Um, and because of the pandemic, there was renewed interest in uppercase and its content. The people were looking for something that could be delivered to their home that was uplifting and pretty and beautiful and inspiring them to get in touch with their, their crafty handmade selves. Um, so I'm very grateful for all the people who subscribed to uppercase during those early days of the pandemic. Um, and I had also developed the uppercase circle, which is an online community for people who subscribe to the magazine. Um, and that's where we can connect with one another and have conversations. And we did, um, we do um, exchanges and trades and um, collaborative projects. And I've hosted guests and done video chats and all sorts of things. And so that has been um, really a lovely place to have during the pandemic. Um, and so those are the, sort of like the extra value things that I provide to my subscribers. None of that is, they don't have to pay any extra for those things. Um, and through all, out of all of this, really, the marketing for uppercase is just that newsletter, that once a week personal communication that I send out. Um, I'm on Instagram, of course, and I sometimes pay attention to <laughs> posting on there. But to be honest, I have zero strategy for Instagram other than to um, enjoy when other people post about my things. And I like to reshare that. And it's really other people doing all the effort for me on Instagram. The fact that people share pictures of the magazines and books when they come out is just invaluable. But I don't put my creative time into thinking about posts and that sort of thing. I just don't have the bandwidth. Um, so yeah, I did not slow down during the pandemic. <laughs> I'll show you what I've done since then. Um, and I keep coming up with more ideas. So I keep publishing other things. Uh, so little you is a, a small, the cuter and the cuter version of uppercase. So this is the uppercase magazine. We'll use a tiny version, but it's, it's for the young at heart about cute, creative things. Um, and of course, the encyclopedia, which I talked about. Well, there's little you. So my son is my um, editor at large for little you and we've done two during the pandemic. There he is last year. <laughs> he's, he's grown so much. In the, <laughs> and he's taller than me now. Um, and then this is the encyclopedia, um, which is for me as a graphic designer to see this with all these beautiful books that I've created and collaborated with artists from around the world on topics that I just absolutely love getting into. This is a, a dream project for me. Um, and these books are really, really expensive uh, to produce. They're at least, you know, 448 pages like this latest one on recycled paper printed in Winnipeg hearing, you know, by the prolific group is very expensive. But how I've, I've managed to fund these is through a crowdfunding on my website, just and that newsletter, just letting people know what I'm doing. And then a year in advance, people can start to pre order it. And by the time it goes to press, I'm able to pool all that money and pay the print bill. And then after that, if there's extra, then I start earning for my time and my efforts um, through the years afterwards that it takes to sell out one of these books. So here's yarn, thread and string from last year. And then beside that is a photo of my latest stack because I just added art supplies on there, which is just officially released this month. And here are the issues that I've done since March 2020 with issue 45 there and that issue sold out really quickly um i've never had an issue sold that quickly um and my my print run is between 10 and 12 000 copies um issue 46 was um pandemic inspired in a way because we're just all doing one little thing at a time just trying to keep all our pieces together issue 47 was um a pivotal issue for me as an editor is the Black Lives Matter edition, I call it, because um, that's what was happening in the world and I wanted to address it. And so 
The cover is a collaboration with many different Black women artists. Um, one person, um, she, she did the overall um, design of these figures. And then each of the different surface patterns in there are by a different artist. And some of them are from the artist, um, the uppercase subscriber community. And then some are people that I um, commissioned. So that was a really lovely um, cover to create at that time of really horrible things going on to create something of beauty and to be positive. Um, issue 48 was all about stationery, and that's a topic that my readers love. And that one sold out really quickly too. Um, 49 is all about surface pattern design and it has an indigenous artist on the cover. Issue 50 was about um, art and science and the crossovers between them. Issue 51 was about um, quilts and patchwork. And issue 52 was um, January of this year um, about illustration, longevity and careers and just keep on showing up, which is pretty much the mandate or the mantra that I have for uppercase it just keep on going, just keep on doing it. Issue 53 is all about gardening and art and 54 that's just coming out right now is about abstract art and abstract thinking. And like I said, here's the brand new art supplies book. And these are the numbers since 2020 till now, you can see we've grown by 2000 subscribers in two years, which is uh, a lot <laughs> and not on purpose. It's just happened and I'm very grateful for it um, because you know I'm still doing the same content as before, um, but having more subscribers paying for it is great. Um, it gives me some financial leeway to spend more. I've, been able to pay all my contributors more every year. Um, I can pay a lot more for my cover now. Um, raising paper costs, I can handle it because I have all these people subscribing. So I'm very grateful to be in this position at this time. So um, I'll be, I think I'm running out of time here, so I'm almost done. Um, but some of the things that have been, I think, where uppercase has done well is the way that I have been um, dealing with renewals. So everyone who's renewal, um, it's time to renew, um, they get emails, right? That's just how we all do it. But um, they, they come from me through a system, but I determine when to send them out. As much as I would like to automate all this, it's never automated. I go in, I decide what's the appropriate thing to send to someone at this point in time in the situation that we're all in right now. And so I always take into account like what is happening in the world? Is it the appropriate time to ask right now? Maybe it isn't. And so I won't send out a renewal campaign. I'll wait till the time is right because I don't want to be that annoying renewal ask from uppercase. I want uppercase to always be a welcome friend who's coming into your inbox or into your home through the mail. Like it's a very, it's a very conscious decision when I'm going to send out renewals. Um, but that being said, I do send up to 12 messages to a, a subscriber to get them to renew um, over the course of typically four months. And then after that, I say, okay, that's, <laughs> that's more than enough. Um, and it's typically almost 60% of people will renew. And even if people don't renew right then and there, they might renew a couple issues later and then buy the back issues and they'll have their, their collection still. Um, and when people subscribe and come to the magazine on my website, um, there's always an option where you can have a subscription and get something sent to you right away. So it's never a, a, a situation where, you know, subscribe now and get something in six to eight weeks. It's like subscribe now and you can, you can start with this issue right now and I'll send it to you. Or if you want, you can subscribe with the next one that's coming out. But there's always, always an option for people to, you know, pay their money and get something mailed right away. Um, and it's always been like that. And I think that's been um, very good for my business. Um, and I always print more than I need. So um, that there's an inventory of back issues available in my fulfillment warehouse system. So someone can always, um, if they're just discovering uppercase for the first time, they can go and buy everything else if they like, which happens frequently. Um, I'm also very organized. Um, I use technology to the best that I possibly can, and that allows me to do a very, very huge amount of work just as a one person. 
Um, and then finally, my approach to business, this is 13 years and counting, is just slow, steady, and small. And like that cover says, just keep showing up. I just keep on doing it. And that's where you can find me. And that's what I have to say is thank you. And thank you is the biggest thing I say all the time. Every newsletter, every time is just thank you to all the readers who love what I do and continue to support Uppercase. That's why it's still going on. So we have one from Melanie. Do you ever discount your sub rate? Yes. yes. Yeah, so um, the, the typical rate is $80 within North America, but I always have a discount code for $15 off. And that's if you're in my newsletter, then I promote it to you. Or if you sign up, then you get that discount offer. Um, so that's always available. Um, I've experimented with or without a discount code, but uh, the discount codes work really well. So I've just acclimatized to that and offer them and it, it's good. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Miriam wants to know, are your readers mostly arts and craft enthusiasts or professional artists? They're both. Um, there's a, a good mix of people who just love creativity and maybe they're, um, they're quilters, but they love all sorts of other things and, and they want to be inspired by other things. And then there's a lot of graphic designers or illustrators or professional surface pattern designers who want to be inspired by a different medium. So um, there's a good mix of, of both professional and um, enthusiasts. Selene asks, um, are all your renewals handled by email? People, um, I, I send out the renewal notices and they click a link and they buy their renewal online in my website. <laughs>